God desires to show us the future and heaven if we want to look. Did the Gospel of Matthew lie about Herod? And what did Adam and Eve look like? All of this and more is coming your way next on Bible Discovery TV. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible and enjoy it in one year. This year we've been doing it chronologically. We have. That's right. So we're going to look at today, we just got a few more days left, but listen, we're going to look at Revelation 4 to 6 with a specific focus on Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, where we learn God desires to show us the future and heaven, if we want to look. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about that and more coming up later. What are you doing, Corey? Today we are exploring some speculation that people say that the Gospel of Matthew was lying. Herod the Great did not kill innocent baby boys in Bethlehem. Lying? Well, that's interesting. Okay, what are you going to share with us? Well, today we're talking with marine biologist Dr. Robert Carter one last time. And in today's interview, I asked him to share with us about some of the research he's working on. Believe me, you're going to want to jo join me for that one. The research on, on marine biology? Well, he's also into, into genetics, too. So. Oh, genetics. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. So Bible Discovery TV continues to go on. Get your Bible out. Get your pocket guide out. If you don't have one, why not? Write for it. And let's go on. Now you and I are going to explore and answer the claims of some skeptics who say that the biblical book of Matthew, the gospel, is lying about Herod the Great and that he did not kill baby boys in Bethlehem. In recent years, historical elements of the New Testament gospels have been regarded skeptically and carelessly discarded as fiction. Today, there are countless YouTube videos and evangelical atheists that have taken up the gospels are fiction mantra. An interesting example is Matthew 2.16. A paranoid, threatened Herod the Great orders the slaughter of any male children aged two and under in the small village of Bethlehem. This slaughter of the innocents narrative portrays Herod the Great as intensely paranoid and concerned with keeping his power while appearing pious. This image correlates perfectly with what is known about Herod the Great from other historical accounts. Herod's primary concern was maintaining his own power, then building monuments to make his fame last, and buying the approval of the masses to maintain these activities. Mostly, though, Herod is remembered for the extreme methods he often employed, slaughtering whole groups of people, acquaintances, friends, relatives, wives, and even his own sons. Herod's massacre of the infants of Bethlehem seems also to be misunderstood numerically. To evaluate it, we need to know how many male infants under two might have lived in Bethlehem at that time. Bethlehem being tiny, it's been estimated at a maximum total of 20 male infants. In 4 BC, the year of Herod's death, we're told by Roman historian Josephus that Herod had prominent families of Judea rounded up, and he ordered that at the hour of his death, they were to be slaughtered, so that one way or the other, all Judea would mourn the day of his death. Apparently, this attempted slaughter of the innocents is acceptable to believe, though Josephus wrote it a couple decades after the Gospel of Matthew was completed. But the slaughter of innocents recorded by Matthew must be ignored as religious myth. 
If history portrays the character of a man as ruthless, paranoid, and preferring to use extreme measures, why are we so quickly rejecting Matthew's account? The key to understanding the book of Revelation is simple. Read the book literally. Make no assumptions about its content. If we do not know something or we have several possible answers, be honest about that. The book is a recitation of a very large and expressive vision. To try to put that into human terms is difficult enough. Many attempt to put the translation of the vision into secret codes and terms that people cannot understand. The Bible is designed to communicate the truths about God's kingdom to the simple as well as the complicated. Let's study. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created." Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. This is Bible Discovery TV. Thanks for staying with us and being a part of this. We are on the last book of the Bible. We have finished and we're going to teach over the next few days from this book, 22 chapters long. It is amazing. Today we read chapters one through four, but I want to focus on this. Now this is important because before we get to the overview, many people have taken revelation out of context and they've read all kinds of things into it. You know, they've read this people and that people and that people and this people, but wait a minute, hold on a minute. If revelation is in the Bible, then revelation is expected to be read by everybody. And so Revelation doesn't have a specific focus that one person can handle. 
but it is a general statement that God is saying so that even the simplest can understand the book of Revelation. Now, as we begin, we begin to study and chapter one is an introduction of Jesus Christ. Chapter two and chapter three are Jesus talking to the church and the church is no longer talked about. And then in chapter four, things change. Here's the overview. We are gonna look at this today. I call this strong heaven. Heaven, we begin to see. Our reading assignment is Revelation chapter four and six, four through six. Focus on Revelation four, one through 11. This is important. Because as you look at this, Revelation chapter 4 is an interesting book or an interesting chapter because it introduces, beloved, heaven. Everybody's running around writing books about heaven. What's heaven like? What's heaven? All you have to do is read Revelation and begin to catch a glimpse of it. So rather than run out here and run out there and run out here and buy all these books on heaven, stay with the Bible. The Bible is a good book on what is heaven like. Now then, let's read from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It says, After these things I looked, John says, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things that must take place after this. Now think about that. John is seeing all these visions and all these things related to uh, the churches on earth, but then all of a sudden the doors open in heaven. He goes up and he says, he says, it's open, I can see it. What does that tell you? What does that whole sequence and that whole situation remind us of, beloved? It reminds us that God desires to show us the future and what exists now in heaven. God wants us to know. He desires us to understand. He realizes that we need to be aware and thinking about heaven. In Colossians chapter 3, he says, set your mind on things above, not on, thing, not on things in this earth, but set your mind on things above where Jesus is. Now that's interesting. Well, let's go on. It says in verses 2 through 5, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne in heaven, a throne. And one who sat on that throne, and he who sat on there was like jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. That's a pretty glamorous look. And there was a rainbow around the throne and in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which all seven spirits of God. That's amazing. Think about that. The seven spirits of God surround this environment. This is the first time John's seeing it. And so it reminds me of this point. God desires us to know that he is not alone in heaven. He's not. There is only one on the throne, but God is not alone. There's a number of people, billions and billions of people who are existing in heaven. I don't want to put a number on it, but that they're existing in heaven and God is not alone. That the planet Earth is a very small speck in the vision of heaven. That's interesting as we go along this way. And think about that, beloved, if you haven't before. I want to read the last part of this. In Revelation 4, verses 6 to 8, it says, Before the throne, there was a sea of glass. A sea of glass? It was like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes, front and back. They could see everywhere. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. And the third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night. They go on saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now think about that. That's an amazing thing. So these are the first images that John sees of heaven. And as you think about that, these creatures are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now we remember this from Ezekiel, or rather from Isaiah, 
And also we remember this, some, some of the parts of the other prophets, and that's what he says. God desires us to know the structure of the people in heaven around his throne. There is order there. And I find that absolutely, totally interesting as we come upon the closing minute of this program. A lot of people like to say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit, he just you know, does whatever and does. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit brings order and he brings attention and he brings the right evidence to the situation where God's presence is. And we need to remember that in our worship. We need to remember that in our music. And we now we're listening to what the Holy Spirit says. We don't know, but the Holy Spirit will speak to us. But it's not just random, random, random. It's order orchestrated by the Holy Spirit of God. And so as we think about heaven and as we understand this and as you read the scripture today, realize that God is speaking to us. lot of history that is contained within the biblical gospels and also the book of Acts. But once the book of Acts was completed and once the New Testament was finished being written, history still continued. Now thankfully we have early church fathers who wrote down Christian history and tradition. So we're going to be taking a look at that to piece together the history of Jesus's family. The New Testament of the Bible is largely quiet on the partial relatives of Jesus Christ through Mary and Joseph. It is recorded that John the Baptist was Jesus' relative through their mothers, and that Jesus had half-brothers and sisters by Mary and Joseph. According to Acts and early Christian history, Jesus' brothers turned from disbelief to belief in him as the Son of God after his resurrection. These men presumably married and had children. While exhaustive accounts of their lives are not possible, there are fragments of traditions recorded in early church history. In the works of 4th century AD historian Eusebius, these accounts are gathered together. He tells us of the life of James, brother of Jesus, as the first bishop of the Jerusalem Christians. For the appointing of the second bishop, he says this, those of the apostles and disciples of the Lord who were still alive gathered from everywhere with those who were, humanly speaking, relatives of the Lord. They all discussed who ought to succeed James, and all unanimously decided on Simeon, son of Clopas, first cousin of the Savior. Eusebius goes on to tell of Simeon's later martyrdom by days-long torture and final crucifixion, but he still fills us in on what he knows of those relatives of Jesus. During the reign of Emperor Domitian, harsh policies against Christianity were passed that saw executions and banishments, including the banishment of the surviving Apostle John. History also records that Domitian was annoyed by the idea of a prophesied Jewish Messiah. The great nephews of Jesus, physically belonging to the bloodline of David, were rounded up and questioned. When Domitian realized they were poor and their beliefs in a Messiah were heavenly, he let them go, thinking them trivial. Yet it was these lowly relatives that would become embedded and dedicated servants of the church. When is it right? When is it wrong? There are principles guiding us in this fallen world to make good decisions about when to fight and how to fight. Join Corey, Janice, and Rod Hembry as they uncover the facts of war and learn what the Bible says about holy war. This video is critical for every believer to know now. When is it right to go to war? For your copy, write to us and send $25 as an offering or more to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada and the rest of the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. 
You can also get this particular video at www.biblediscoverytv.com. For safe giving, give there. Thank you for staying with us here on Bible Discovery TV. Now, I need to tell them on this program, this is a chronological reading program. That's right. Until next year, just a few days away, we're going to start all over again. But on the next Quick Study Television, we're going to focus on Revelation 7 to 11, where we learn God commands that the prophecies contained in the small book is not to be revealed. What am I talking about? You'll have to tune in tomorrow and find out on the next Quick Study Television program. Right now, Ryan is here to explain to us what's going on with Cosmic Mysteries. Well, coming up now, I'm going to be asking Dr. Carter to share with us about some of his current research and about what his goals over the next five to ten years are. We've been working on, on several projects for, for a number of years. Um, one of them is a, a, we want to know what Adam and Eve looked like. We want to know what their genomes were. And we think that there's enough data that's been collected already through the, the HapMap project and the Thousand Genomes project. And there are a lot of genealogical testing services out there that'll uh, sequence people's DNA for you know $100 or so. There's so much data available right now, today. And we already know what you know, the gen genetics looks like across the world, we think we can back the clock up and start from people today and go back only 150 to 200 generations, that's when Adam and Eve lived, and say this is actually what Adam and Eve were, what genes they carried and how they looked. And we think this is actually, it's an amazing time to be alive right now because this would not have been possible even five years ago. Evolutionary theory loves to extrapolate into deep time. But if you think about it, if you, um, if you took a one inch line and said if this inch equaled 1,000 years, how long a line would you need to represent all of evolutionary time all the way back to the Big Bang? You'd need a line over 200 miles long. And most of that time is outside the historical record of mankind. Interestingly, biblical time a little over 6,000 years, you need a line a little bit more than 6, 000, uh, six, six inches long. Well, that's almost exactly the same as historical record. We can actually validate a lot of things in science if we appeal to what we know about history. Like, you know, how many people lived here, how long this kingdom existed, where this people group came from. But as soon as we get past the historical era, we're into a field of extrapolation that gets worse and worse and worse the farther back you go. So yeah, you might be able to prove that a murder happened yesterday. It's really hard to prove one that happened 10 years ago. It would be almost impossible to prove one that happened 100 years ago, even though a couple of cases like, have, have happened where they actually say, this person did that crime, even though it was a long time ago. But the further back in time you go, the less certain you can be. So one of the powerful things about the creationist argument is we're not appealing to extrapolations into deep, deep, deep time where we cannot possibly know what happened back there. We're actually not doing much extrapolation at all. So when we're talking about recreating Adam and Eve, we're saying, first of all, look, when we look at genetics, all the numbers, all the processes that are happening, they're pointing in the opposite direction of evolution. They're, pop they're pointing towards something that happened recently. And so then when we look at these things and we say, well, if we look at what's happening now and we just take the rates we're seeing and the processes we're seeing and we back it up, we believe we're going to arrive at Adam and Eve. Just using what we know about science without having to make some grand theory. If you want to keep up to date with Dr. Carter's work, you'll need to go to CMI's website at creation.com. There you'll also find the work of his colleague, Dr. John Sanford. Now, Dr. Sanford is a world-renowned geneticist and will actually be joining us on the Quick Study program sometime next year. That sounds good. Now we've got Dr. Carter and we've got Dr. Sanford and they're putting together, they're working on this DNA going back to the beginning where they get to understand what Adam and Eve look like. It's really cool. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. 
Well, anyway, we're going to look like something new because we got brand new Bible guides coming your way all about wisdom next year. And if you want a copy of this, a piece of these Bible guides, we're going through the Bible normally, then write to us at P.O. Box 150 Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668050. In Canada, P.O. Box 456 Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. That's our address. And also I want to mention that it's an offering in any amount. And then, of course, if you want to reserve your copy quickly, you can call us in the United States of America at 724-733-8336. In Canada, 519-940-8338. Now remember that our Bible guide, our actually Bible guide is available also on the Bible site, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Recently, one person exclaimed that worship of God really is for us. But the truth is, Revelation shows us heaven. And the worship and the praise of God happens there in more intense forms than it does here. God does not need praise and worship, but it happens when we're in His presence. There's great worship team in heaven, worshiping and praising God night and day. Mankind praises God, not just for the dramatic rescue He performed for us, but also because God is great all the time. And all the time, God is great. With that we pray, Lord, I desire to worship and praise your name. Help me to find the music and the words to do that. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, we've got a great question for you. Where does the Bible actually say this? Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. What an interesting thing that is. Now, when you think about that, that's the New King James English. You say, well, I think I know where that is. If you think you know, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the strength in your mind at the bottom of the page and it'll take you to all the answers for the whole year. But I want to tell you that Jesus Christ has brought this program to you this month, this year, and he wants you to know something. Not only have we studied his word, but we've studied his character. And his character he gave for you, but you must choose him. You have to decide that he is your Lord. Pray and say, Jesus Christ, I take you as my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. I believe you died on the cross and rose again on the third day. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study Bible Discovery TV. Remember, we are supported by viewers just like you. Would you become a Discovery Partner and support us with an offering in any amount? You can do so by supporting online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.